It's time to get your checking account to zero with free checking from PenFed. That's zero ATM fees, zero balance requirements, and zero time spent waiting for your paycheck to direct deposit because you can receive it up to two days early. Open your account with just $25 and see how big zero can be. Apply online today at penfed.org slash free checking. Early direct deposit eligibility may vary between pay periods and timing of payers funding. To receive any advertised product, you must become a member of PenFed, insured by NCUA. All right, here we go. Welcome back to the Mediocre Alaskan Podcast. My guest today is Craig Van Arsdale. He moved to Alaska a couple months ago, lives in Saldatna. He's been a frequent guest on the Rich Outdoors Podcast and recently returned from a caribou hunt with Cody. Uh, thanks for being on here, man. Yeah, no, thanks for having me, Jeff. So you are new to the state of Alaska, but it's still got to be super fresh. It's been a couple of months. Like, are you just love loving being an Alaskan resident? Yeah, I'm still like, it's almost like I'm still in shock. I've just been like nonstop. You know, I moved up here in mid May. Just, you know, from getting the early salmon run to, you know, having family and friends up a couple times and getting out doing some spring bear hunting and now uh, Kodiak and caribou. I've just been, been a dream man living it up it's so hard during the summer to kind of keep up with everything there is to do like it's not just a matter of here's the one thing like there's one thing to do so i'm going to do that it's like there's too many things there's not enough hours and then the sun is up all the time and so you're just getting up getting up every time going to sleep with the sun waking up with the sun have you found there's like a little bit of exhaustion or are you just uh pushing through with adrenaline uh, a little bit of both. Uh, yeah, the sunlight thing has been a shock to me. It's been hard, you know, but not getting very good sleep and just kind of now starting that it's getting dark around 10, you know, or a little after seems to be getting into a little better sleep schedule now. But, but yeah, I was really messed up there for that first few months. Yeah. When it starts to leave, it leaves quick and it, it kind of sucks because September is still a, it's an unbelievably great month here in Southern Southeast Alaska. It's one of my favorite months because there's a lot of stuff to do, but you've lost an hour, hour and a half on the back end there. And it can be, uh, it can be tough to fit everything you want to win. Yeah. Yeah. No, you do kind of get used to the really long days and then they start shortening up on you and kind of reality kicks in. Yeah. So you just got back from uh, caribou hunt with Cody Rich. He was a, he was a cool dude. He and he and Jaden are uh, that that Rich Outdoors podcast that they have going on is is great. And uh, I've hung out with Jaden quite a bit every time I go down to to Wyoming. So great people. How did you get hooked up with uh, with with Cody? How'd you meet him? Um, I think originally we had met through original uh, mutual friend Nick Schmidt. And then I actually, you know, we did a podcast. This was like back in probably 2017. And then we actually met for the first time at a sheep show. Mm. And shortly after that, we kind of planned a mule deer hunt. And, you know, now we've done a few hunts together. So it's, it's been a good, uh, good friend. And we seem to hunt together pretty well. Yeah. As bad as social media is, it's so great at connecting people that are like-minded. Like so many people are like finding hunting buddies and things like that, or like fellow entrepreneurs within the outdoor realm. It's if you use it for good, then it's really good, but it can also be used for evil. Yeah, no, I agree a hundred percent. That's, that's exactly how I look at social media anymore. As I've just met so many great people through it, that it's, it's worth, uh, you know, any bad that comes with it. Yeah. You mentioned that you and Cody hunt pretty well together. What do you kind of look for in a, in a hunting buddy? Because sometimes your best friend is not the type of person you want to hunt with. Like you can hang out and you can watch a football game or you can, you know, you can mutually you know, make some sausage or, or, or process some deer together. But when it comes to actually going through the misery of, of hiking in, hiking out or fishing or whatever it is, they don't necessarily mesh with you. So what do you look for in, in a hunting buddy? Yeah, so that's a great, great question. And, uh, I, I think it boils, it's a lot of things, first of all, but, uh, you know, obviously you got to be able to have, you know, the, the good friendship from the beginning, but then, you know, someone that, that kind of has similar goals to you, someone that may have like a similar risk profile to you, right? Like you don't want to, 
get out of the mountains and your buddy's too afraid to, you know, walk across the river with you or something, right? That could be kind of like a debilitating, you know, part of your hunt. Um, yeah, you know, some, somebody that, that just has that same end goal as you and is willing to, you know, if you're willing to go through the pain, if you're willing to go through the struggle, you know, when you say you're going to do 10 days, you know that you're both going out there to do 10 days. Um, one of you is not going to, you know, pull the plug and say we're done. Um, someone that's as interested in your success as they are theirs. Um, yeah. So those are kind of some of the things I think about. When I was watching, I think it was your Instagram story today, which is the uh, 27th of August. And you posted, uh, the river crossing that you did. The first thing I noticed was you're not wearing Crocs. Are you not a Crocs guy? Or I'm sure there's a lot of people who are like, dude, Crocs, man. Like what do you, yeah, what, well, my, my Crocs were in the truck. <laughs> oh, yeah, so. I was gonna say, uh, like someone as experienced as you, like I would have figured, man, Crocs would have been down there. Or I'm sure, did Cody have Crocs? Yeah, no. So he didn't have his. He was in the truck as well. We just, we really didn't think we would be crossing a river, mm. and that, you know, it just the hunt kind of, you know, we went in there to go spend two days back there, and then you know how that goes, though. You look over the next ridge, and oh, there's a big river in there, and that's a few miles away, and then we end up on the other side of the river. Yeah. So and then that's something that I think, you know, learning a lot in the lower 48 and growing up there that like, for the most part in lower 48, you can get across most rivers and creeks by, you know, a log or even walking just straight across in your gators, as long as they're lower than your gators. But, you know, all these Alaskan streams and rivers are quite a bit bigger. So I think that's something I'm just going to have to, you know, be diligent about, strapping those things in my pack all the time yeah it stays cool and damp too so if you do get your feet wet like it's not going to dry out like you're 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 in for it at that point right yeah um sure. without giving too much away what unit were you guys in uh we hunted the hall road oh sweet excellent good yeah good yeah that's uh another thing about being in alaska is just the opportunities and then being on the on the road system in Southeast Alaska, I'm not on the road system. Like it's just 1700 islands. So if I want to go do yeah. something cool up North, like it's when I did the caribou hunt in March, flew up to Fairbanks and it was like 51 degrees when I left catch a can and it's, you know, negative 15. The day we hunted was negative 30 and it just, Oh my gosh, this is insane. But yeah. when you're on the road system in the interior, like you are in, in Saldana, um, it just opens up so many more opportunities. So yeah, it's, it's still a shock to me though, still going from the lower 48, right. With yeah. just, you know, roads everywhere to, well, I don't know how many really main highways we got here, like five or six, seven, I don't know. Yeah. So it's still pretty, pretty limited, but yeah, we brought my trailer up there. And so we kind of, we were just throwing cots in the back of my trailer and sleeping in there. And so it kind of made it a little bit easier and then backpacking out from there. Was it like eight hours, 12 hours, something like that? Drive from Saldana? Eight hour, eight and a half hours to Fairbanks. Okay. And then another six or so for seven, that's just, seven hours, yeah, yeah, probably up to up to the area. Yeah. Because I think Wiseman is like the last gas and that was about six uh six or so hours. I've been scouting out some walk in spots, uh both closer to Anchorage than also out of Fairbanks since I have some buddies up there. So fly up there and just looking at areas maybe you could go and you could walk into these areas and all right, when's the last gas? Because you don't have random gas stations out in the middle. When you leave a town, you leave a town. There's there's nothing in between. It's funny when yeah, people that, talk about nothing being in between this town and this town. It's like, there's nothing and there's like Alaska nothing. We're talking no yeah, ranches, like nothing no nothing. 500 miles. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, yeah, I, no, I, I literally... Go ahead. Yeah, I was I was checking like the last gas is the last gas. There's no chance. So you've got to either load yeah. <laughs> some jerry jugs in the back or or you're in trouble. Yeah, and that was something that I guess I wasn't fully prepared for. I mean, I had extra cans and stuff, but I just didn't think logistically how much that was going to play into it. And I didn't know how much we'd be driving up there. And so that kind of hit us when we got up there too, is that, you know, you hit cold foot, you get your last gas. 200 miles 150 miles up there you start hunting and then you've got another 150 miles to dead horse which is your other gas yeah and you know you just you only get a couple few days even if you've got three or four cans you know between 
fueling up every day. And then you drive 150 miles and you burn a quarter tank just getting back to your hunting area. Yeah. So it definitely is a logistical issue to deal with. I'd heard of people that just kind of go, I've never hunted the Hall Road. Um, people just kind of going up there and just driving up and down it, hoping to find a group of caribou that is close enough to the road uh, to then try to make a stock. Because you can't hunt uh, with rifle. Is it three miles or five miles within the road? Five miles, five miles. on either side. Yeah. So you're, you're going archer in between. And so if you are doing that, like if you commit to an area and just start walking in, there could be nothing there and you're wasting a ton of time. So did you guys just kind of drive slow? Did you drive kind of a back and forth? Did you get to a knob in yep. glass or what'd you guys do? We were doing a lot of driving back and forth. And what we found is that you would drive and see some caribou and it would be fairly consistent that you might see caribou on a particular ridge in one area. And, you know, you could come back and they might be there, you know, hours later, a day later or whatever, but there was some consistency to that area. But uh, we would also find that you, the other area like that might be 30, 40, 50 miles away. In between, there really wasn't much consistency. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of part of the challenge, too, is that you'd be covering, trying to cover ground, quote unquote, by driving. But you're burning a lot of fuel doing that and then making stocks from the road at caribou that you see, you know, typically two to three miles off the road. Sometimes you're crossing the river to do a stock, you know, a stock takes five, six, seven hours to do, even if it's a fail, you know? Yeah. So you can only do one or two stocks a day if you're lucky from kind of doing it that way. That's the funny thing too about up here is it's not a matter of finding a spur off the spur, off the spur, off the spur, off the spur of the main road. You are on the road. So did you see yeah. a lot of people on that road? Were there other... Uh, people who were trying to archery hunt, then how did that impact uh, where you guys ended up going? Yeah, there was a pretty, you know, I've not hunting before. I don't have a whole lot to judge you by, but I would say there was a decent amount of people up there doing what we were doing. And it did have some effect to, you know, every once in a while I would see a bull that would be, you know, maybe only a mile off the road that was in a decent stalking location. And you'd be glassing and looking around and all of a sudden you'd glass up a guy already <laughs> stalking that bull, you know, a couple hundred yards behind him or something. And be like, well, it's, uh, we're on to the next, you know. Mm -hmm. So you kind of are battling for, um, you know, the caribou that you find that are closer. How is you're still kind of new to the like resident hunting up here in Alaska, but how does the amount of people compare to down South? I've done some mule deer hunting in Wyoming and I, I got a nice mule deer for me. I was a pretty small four point comparatively, but I was just amazed at how many people are going to those small patches of land that I thought might be overlooked. You know, you hear people talk about, Hey, I'll go to this overlooked little spot, you know, like everyone goes to these sort of spots. So either be willing to go further or find these little overlooked little patches, little squares. And there are just people everywhere and you could park your truck and people would park right next to you. There was one spot, my, my wife and I fiance at the time, we, we parked, we were the first ones there and we hiked up right at first light. And then by the time we were hack, hiking out three hours later, we hadn't glassed anything up. There were four other cars there. And there, the access point is about 300 yards long. So the expectation is that Alaska is going to be free of all that because there's so much more space. Were you surprised that there were that many people? Or is that just kind of the thing, you guess? Yeah, I mean, I feel like there was definitely less people than like what you're talking about. Because I've, I've experienced you know exactly what you're talking about many, many times. And there are definitely way more hunters on the road systems in the lower 48. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I guess because of that too, I've just kind of, you know, over the years gotten used to, uh, you know, you've got to almost make your own place, you know, or you see people, you don't know, like that and they just on to the next, you know, they can have it. After years of fine print contracts and getting ripped off by big wireless providers, if we've learned anything, it's that there's always a catch. So when I first heard that Mint Mobile offers premium wireless starting at just 15 bucks a month, I thought, what's the catch? But after talking to them and using their service, it all made sense. There isn't one. Mint Mobile's secret sauce is that they're the first company to sell wireless service online only. 
They cut out the cost of retail stores and pass those sweet savings directly to you. For anyone who hates their phone bill, Mint Mobile offers premium wireless for just 15 bucks a month. I was hesitant about having to get a new phone and a new phone number, but with Mint, you can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone and your same phone number along with all of your existing contacts. Mint Mobile gives you the best rate whether you're buying for one or for a family, and at Mint, families start at two lines. All plans come with unlimited talk and text plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Switch to Mint Mobile and get premium wireless service starting at just 15 bucks a month. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and to get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com/waypoint. That is mintmobile.com/waypoint. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash waypoint. Uh, that's always kind of been my mentality is if it gets too too many people, you know, then I'll just leave. I can have it. Mm. Where has been a place where you've really found that sort of, there is no one else here. And you, I mean, you've done mule deer in, in Colorado, which seems like it would probably be the busiest. And yet you've also hunted Kazakhstan and Greece, Greenland. So yeah. I would think there'd be zero people in Kazakhstan. Is that yeah, yeah, yeah? Is There's that right? Else out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just just you in the mountains and your guide, and that's it for long, long ways. Yeah, um, I mean, you know, I I floated. I've done a float hunt in Alaska before. You know, you know, deer hunted uh, Kodiak a couple times. You know, the, all all those times you're just you know just nobody you don't you might see a fl- plane fly over your head and that's it and i mean that's definitely my preference and and i found places like that though in the lower 48 you know packing into areas to hunt elk in idaho and um you know even with a lot more people in the lower 48 i've always pretty much been able to find our way around away from people mm-hmm. it just requires more effort <laughs> yeah what are some of the things that i mean is it just sheer miles that you put between where you park and where you go or what what is it that you look for to make sure that uh, or to try to best ensure that you have a place to yourself yeah i mean it's not always miles i can definitely say that like uh, you know some of those places that i've learned in idaho and stuff like that are really not that far away they're just sometimes it's just overlooked country that that honestly even it's not like I could pick them out on a map. It's just like you have to go there and hunt areas. And then you, you know, sometimes, you'll, especially with elk, you'll find timbered areas that you would otherwise probably not find on a map just by putting your finger out there, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, go putting boots on the ground and having a little bit of time built into your hunt to, to do that and, you know, find an area that you otherwise might not find on Google Earth has, has helped. Mm-hmm. How much time do you spend on like Google Earth, Onyx, Basecamp, whatever you use? I have actually really like toned that down personally. I used to spend a ton of time, like say five years ago, I was the guy that would spend just hours and hours and hours on there. And I feel like I've just kind of learned over the years that like, you know, find a general area, get in the unit, drive the roads, which, you know, obviously these things are not going to work in Alaska, but... um, (laughs) you know get out get your feet on the ground and like figure it out you know because you can do all that internet scouting and those places don't often you know pan out you know Mm -hmm. but having you know five or so spots that you can just jump from one to the next you know plan a b c d you know you can move quickly yeah It'll be interesting to see as you're going through your first winter up here in Alaska, how much, if you end up going back to the map scouting. uh, Yeah, maybe I'll be bored in the house, sitting by the fire, (laughs) burning my eyes out. (laughs) Yeah, there's nothing else you can do. So it's like, yeah, let's look at some maps here. Yeah. Are you... uh, I I will say I've been looking at maps though a lot, just because it's like, you know, the state is just so big. Yeah. And you have to fly or take a boat or, you know, hike way into somewhere and there's less access. So, like, it definitely is a little overwhelming by, like, looking at the maps. It's the, it seems harder right now for me to determine a spot than it would if I was in lower 48. Yeah. You look at, like, for mountain goat, for, for doll sheep, so much of the stuff looks good. 
and some of it, yeah. it looks all the same. Like how, how would you choose? And so you could totally be scouting one area and, and then it doesn't even work. It's almost, it's so valuable and yet it's totally fruitless at the same time. It's a weird feeling. Being yeah, I know. And I've, I, I hear people say that, that you could be looking at a mountain range and there might not be a dull sheep in that range for 20 <laughs> miles, Yeah, you know? Yeah. And yeah, how are you going to know that without like talking to someone or getting some knowledge or, or just going out there and it's so expensive, right? Like you can't just fly out to every area, you know? Yeah, yeah you're cer- certainly not going to drive up to the brooks uh, one weekend to uh, to hike around and scout like that. That's a massive <laughs> right. undertaking <laughs> itself. Yeah. yeah. The southeast is kind of funny because like the big ticket items are, are mountain goat and uh, black-tailed deer. Um but those you can pretty much find in southern and southeast Alaska. Unit uh, two, Prince of Wales, and Unit one, uh, Ketchikan area. You just get into some alpine, you're going to find deer. So it's not a matter of are the deer there; it's how many are there, and what's the access, and might you be able to have this by yourself? And then uh, for mountain goat, same sort of thing. Outside of the draw areas, the registration areas. How can I get to right. this spot, and how can I maybe access that? But when I start looking for like walk-in spots for doll sheep, I'm thinking, well, you got to pick a mountain range. And then even there, it's just, it's just crazy. It is fun though. It's, it's fun to be able to, to look at those and just see that there's no, it's not gridded out in nice rectangles and squares like down South. And when you right. turn on like the property ownership on, on X, it's, it's, state or federal you know there's you don't have those red squares of you know steve owns this area or whatever it's it's so cool so has that been kind of a a liberating feeling being in alaska where you can pretty much hunt anywhere you look yeah no definitely i I will say i'm not and maybe maybe you could answer this to some extent but i'm not clear on like you do see native lands quite a bit Mm. And I'm just not 100% versed yet on how to determine what of those lands you can and can't hunt. So that, that's what I've looked at. Yeah, that really varies based on location. I remember growing up in Klawak and, you know, we would ride our bikes down to the river and we access the river by going through native land. Like the whole area was native land. But, you know, there, it wasn't really commercialized. There weren't a whole lot of, whole lot of people going there there was a, or it still is a fish hatchery on the river. And so you had just crazy runs of, of coho coming back up and it's a pretty short river, but you know, everyone just drive there, you ride your bikes, it's all good. But then more people started finding out about how good the fishing is there. And so you'd have people come into Kluwak, staying at local lodges or DIY or whatever. And so I think three or four years ago, they put up a sign that said no trespassing. And now you have to buy a permit for 75 bucks to access the river. Which is totally fine. Like you're on private property. So as a kid, right. you know, I was technically trespassing or they didn't really care and that's totally fine. So um, I think some areas are better at posting, hey, here are the requirements. If you want to hunt or you want to access this stuff, here's who you pay, here's how much you pay, and then you're good to go. Other areas you're supposed to ask for permission, but I'm not sure if anybody does. Right. Um, so yeah, it's kind of... I think it kind of depends on, on where you're at. Um, but that's definitely something to, to look at. Um, have you read Steve Rennell's book, um, American Buffalo? I did. When he was talking about getting access to hunt the Buffalo, like that was, that was some real, and it was very clear that you could not access certain lands. So, um, I guess it's just a matter of being able to find who you're supposed to talk to, to, then ask permission or what you owe or what to do there. So, yeah. And I think that's where I'm just a little bit caught up right now is I just don't know all the places to do that or, or the easiest way that most people are doing it or, yeah. So that's something I'll have to pay attention to. Yeah. The, un, I don't want to say unfortunate, but there's a lot of areas that are attempting to limit access to non federally qualified users. Um, especially up in the North Slope part of, uh, I think it was maybe all of Unit 23 and part of 26A. Uh, they were trying to shut down a non-federally qualified user. So unless you live there, you couldn't hunt there. And that area included Kotzebue, which is a major yeah, I, I area. Oh, I man. commented on that. I couldn't, I, it doesn't make, you know, and that's, I don't think a lot of people didn't fully understand the way that they say uh, non-resident in that case. I mean, they're talking, if you're a Fairbanks, Alaska resident, you don't get to go. 
Yeah. So and, a- anyone who's not a native within those communities. Yeah. And even Ketchikan, we have 10,000 people. Like that's, that's a tiny, that doesn't even get you on the map down south. But, um, and I totally, you know, growing up in Cloaca, a very small native community. And so the traditional values were so much more intact and, um, you know, just they have a different connection with the pulse of the land and the, um, the resources. And, you know, so I, growing up with that subsistence lifestyle, absolutely no to understand it. But at the same time, if the biologists are saying that the, the herds are, they're in fine condition and most of the people that are going to fly in there anyway, they're going to provide money to the community. They're flying out somewhere, you know? So a lot of the locals who are going to be hunting, they're hunting a lot closer and they have longer seasons. You know, the person who's going to fly in there to do that hunt is going to be there for two weeks. Right. Whereas you have three, four, five, six months in there. Are some areas I think you can get like five caribou per day. Um, right. So it's, it's a really difficult conversation because it does pit non-residents versus, you know, the locals who live there and the, even other Alaskans against the people who live there. So it's a really sticky thing. But if, if the biologists are saying that the populations are great, they've been managed very well so that these user groups can use it, then I just don't know why you wouldn't keep them open. I know yeah, the I appeal. I agree 100%. We, we have to lean on the biology and the science. I mean, that's all we really have. Yeah. I, I understand the appeal of having like your own private hunting zone, you know, hunting refuge, but, um, and, and if, and if populations do get poor and things need to be done, then, you know, do a different dross or, or something like that. But once it's, once people are locked out, they're locked out. Right. Yeah. We don't seem to get things back. No. Are there other things about Alaska that like big issues or news or things like that, that you didn't even really hear or know about, but now that you live here, you're becoming more in tune with what's going on? Uh, I think just those couple, those last couple of native things, the, you know, the, the lockdowns on land there were, were really the only things that surprised me so far. Uh, I know you guys have one down there too, right? For, for deer and goats or something? Or Yeah. Uh, unit two, which is where I grew up, they limited the non-federally qualified from four to two. Um, but that's something that, you know, growing up on Prince of Wales, you know, I've kind of seen the population kind of undulate and change. And I've seen a lot more wolves. And I went wolf trapping with some buddies and just saw how many there are and saw how smart they are and how impossible it is to totally trap them out. Because you're not, you're not flying over in a helicopter and counting them like you are in Yellowstone. You know, this place right. is dense and crazy. So, um, but they reduced it from four to two. You know, that's not just banning outside people. So that was at least maybe a reasonable reaction. In the southern part of Prince of Wales, you can still hunt on opening day. Um, But Tongass National Forest, in certain areas, mostly the road system, you can't hunt if you're non-fairly qualified until the 16th. So you still get to hunt it. You can only get two rather than four, but at least that's a compromise. The areas that they're, they're looking at shutting down, um, unit four in the Huna area, I believe is, uh, they're looking at, at shutting down. Cause you know, it seems like there's a lot of traffic coming in from Juno heading over to, to those islands. And it just, you know, why can't we compromise? Why, why, why are we going from four to zero? Why can't we go a four to a two, you know, something, you know, work together rather than divide hunters up. And what, from your perspective, um, is the best thing that we should be doing as hunters? Um, I think part of it is communicate our concerns. I think there are some organizations that are, um, that are out there that, that will help if they get the right information. I think, uh, backcountry hunters and anglers is a great organization. I think sometimes they get a bad name, especially in Alaska, because it seems like to a lot of Alaskans that all BHA does is, you know, they, they put together their rendezvous and everybody drinks, you know, micro brews and takes a picture with Steve Ranella. But, you know, there is a lot of people and a lot of power. And if they were connected, maybe, you know, they could weigh in on these things. So, you know, posting on Facebook, how upset you are that there, someone's about to do this, that doesn't get to the right ears. So, um, you know, involving these other groups that might have some more power and some more backing and so, and, and some more money. And then also testifying. Like I, I've never even thought about doing public comment testifying, but I was listening to Randy Newberg talk about, 
you know, just, he, he's always up there, you know, people know him cause he is up there and he is, he is educated and he's giving testimony on these things. And I thought, man, like guys like Randy are the reason why, you know, people can still hunt down South. And even though I live in Alaska, like what's, what's my role as a hunter? And that's, I need, uh, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to testify. So when it came to that, uh, that potential closure of the 60 million acres up North, I testified and I testified in a way that was, you know, I thought was, this is a logical argument. This is, you know, honest from a rational person. You know, if you go in there and you just start like, well, these, you know, then they're going to disregard you. They're not going to listen to you because there's nothing in there that appeals to logic. It's just all emotion. And you go off on some sort of, you know, crazy rant, you know, it's very easy to disregard that. So I think being involved, but also being involved in a way that it's tough to dismiss a good logical argument is, is the right way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. So living in Soldatna, um, I was surprised. I went up there for my honeymoon in, in June and I was shocked at how much private land there was on the Kenai river and how little access there was. Um, was that kind of surprising to you? That that was a surprise. And whatever isn't private is closed to bank fishing for the most part. In you know, there's there's very specific areas that they allow bank fishing. And, and I now understand it a little bit better, right? It's you know they're trying to protect the uh, you know where the salmon fry are are living in the spring, right? So they can make it through to, to the ocean, the bank erosion. But uh, yeah, I kind of. A couple times I had, you know, oh, I'm just going to look at Onyx and see if I can find a piece of public and I'll go hike, you know, way off the road system and find my own little fishing hole. And then, you know, I get down there and there's signs all over there saying, you know, you can't fish here. Yeah. And then, you know, looking deeper into the regulations, which which I also believe are some of the most strictest regulations I've ever seen. And, (laughs) you know, all the lower 48 hunting I've seen, you know, they're pretty basic down in the lower 48. But in Alaska, it seems like if you're not really looking at everything and reading through all, you are not catching all these little things and, you know, attachments and maps and stuff that are a little deeper in the rigs. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. That was like the perfect, perfect serve up. Cause we're talking about regulation for the sake of regulation that might not help, but when you understand the regulations that are on the Kenai river, as far as making sure that the habitat is good, that's exactly why there was, you know, was it a record uh, sockeye run this year. Yeah. Um, 2.5 million fish or so. And that, you know, that's not a, that's not a hatchery fed thing. You know, that's not a stocked salmon thing. That is because the regulations that are there are purposeful and they're there to preserve the species. And I mean, it's working, right? The, the sockeye is crazy. Um, did you go to the Russian river? I did. I fished, uh, Mostly, I just fished the sanctuary on the early run when it mm. uh, exceeded escapement. Yeah, which in, escapement like so wait, what is escapement? Right, uh, we went to <laughs> to the Russian before it was open for that, and I knew it was going to be crazy, and it was even crazier than I thought. And yeah. that whole side, it's amazing the amount of work that's been put in to preserve the bank on that side. Right, and there's that kind of elevated trail and only specific access points. I mean, just so great. And then people can cross the river and then the whole other side is totally just beat up. And you think this is exactly why this is in place because you have to have that spawning ground. You have to have that habitat. Otherwise you're not going to have fish coming back, let alone, you know, setting records of fish coming back. Yeah, which is like to to this day and age, it almost seems like I get used to, you know, everything seems to be in a decline. So when you can see something like that, that it's gotten better in 2021, it's, I mean, it's, that's a good thing to see. It makes, makes me happy, you know? Yeah. That that, um, 40 mile herd up of caribou up near Fairbanks going to hunt that, like that thing had been down to like the 10,000 caribou in the the 70s and now it's up to 80,000. I mean, there are some great examples of, of successful management. And a lot of times that's spearheaded by people who want to hunt. Like hunters are not the enemy who want to kill everything. Like they're the right. people who are making sure that the resource survives. 
Yeah, I know. And on that note, again, I, I got to attend my first, you know, I've been wanting to go for a long time and Pope and Young had, you know, had to cancel a convention in 2020 with the pandemic and it finally had to have it in July and I went down there. And, you know, one of the things that was interesting is there were more world records um, in that two year reporting period in 2020, 2019 than, you know, I think ever. Hmm. So, I mean, that's a pat on the back to everything that we're doing just across the board, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're shooting older and more mature animals than we ever have been. And this population seems to be doing pretty well. Yeah. Do you think that, like, flash forward 10 years, you're still in Alaska. Do you feel Alaska can remain pretty stable and pretty great while the lower 48 does or do you not have as positive an outlook for what's going to happen down in the lower 48? Yeah, I don't have as positive <laughs> an outlook on the lower 48. <laughs> it's part of the reason why I moved. Huh. I just seen like, you know, living up, living there, growing up there, putting in for every single Western state that I possibly can for 11 years or so. And seeing general season tags, you know, pretty much tags that you're quote unquote guaranteed to draw as long as you give them your money go away basically in the last just two or three years. Um, so yeah, I mean, I hope I'm wrong, but it seems like just being able to go buy a deer tag at Walmart is going to go away. What do you think's the biggest contributor to that? Um, I think it's the information, uh, it's information on how to go do those kind of things is literally everywhere. Um, the application, pro, you know, companies that are, and it's, you know, that's, it, I'm not saying any of it's bad. I'm a part of all that. I, you know, I, I subscribe to these application things. I, I watch people's YouTube videos, you know, I consume all these things, but I think that, that you know, the digital age that we live in now has making, made all that stuff extremely easy um and people are breaking it down they're making you know a, a guy that might have only wanted whitetails in wisconsin his whole life he gets that you know third hit point of seeing guys you know hunt somewhere for mule deer and he's like yep that's easy i'm going you know i mean that that's how i see it is because we're not really seeing hunting sales hunting license sales go up right they're generally across the border, even declining, but we're seeing more people, I think, coming to the West than the lower 48 and hunting. Yeah. And I mean, that's the only thing I can come up with for why the tags seem to be getting so much higher and why the demand for Western hunting is higher. But overall, hunting license sales don't seem to be that much higher. Yeah, it's, it's awesome to see the opportunities into these different states, states that I wouldn't even have considered. But then, you know the strategy for putting in for points, you know, and like, where do you put your money? And then which States should you, should you put them in? And if you have this many points, you can draw this. So rather than the person who with their buddies or with their family is going to their deer camp somewhere, it's now deer camp there. Plus one of the buddies drew an antelope in Wyoming or someone drew a mule deer and somewhere else. And so all of a sudden you have this hunter who has more opportunities, which is awesome. It's great to have people with more opportunities, but there is a cost and it's, yeah. it's, it's tough. Like I, I love when I have buddies up here to hunt. Um, actually I shouldn't say up, they come down from Fairbanks to hunt blacktail because it's an opportunity They have a buddy here. It's all good. Um, but then it's just more pressure. It's just more people. And you know, it's, it's, it's not as limited as is other areas, but you know, Alaska still it's, I'm I'm concerned more for the lower 48 than I am up here, but there's part of me that's worried about up here too. Well, yeah, and I think I think to sum it up, it's just it's technology just taking its place, right? I mean, all the way to the mapping programs. I mean, you know, 10 years ago, you couldn't just log on to. I mean, 10 years ago, Google Earth was you know around, but it was nothing what it is today. And of course, Onyx, you know, wasn't around, and all Basecamp and every other mapping software that's competing against each other you know all the roads anymore like every road is mapped yeah in the lower 48 every road is mapped up here <laughs> probably not yet 
um, which I think is good. I'd like to see them not be mapped, you know, for my own selfishness. But yeah, yeah, it is what it is. It's still, I don't know. It still kind of feels like the golden age of of hunting if you have like the wherewithal, um, the ability to save, you know, and, and make stuff happen. Like there's so much opportunity still, like it's such a great time to be alive and, you know, you have your, uh, your website and you can share stuff and I have my website and, and podcasts. It's just a great time to be, you know, contributing your verse. Um, but, uh, who knows what it's going to be in the future. Yeah, no, I agree 100. percent We are. I mean, I feel. I, I think that same thing all the time. Like we are extremely fortunate for what we have and you know what we're able to do right now today. Mm. So speaking of internet, I'm assuming this is going to be the right segue. How did you find out about hunting in Kazakhstan and Greenland? Greenland um, was the first one I did. That was kind of like out of the country. And I actually had been scrolling through YouTube, just watching hunting videos <laughs> at the time. And Kurt Wells um, with Bowhunter Magazine and uh, Tom Hoffman, Bowhunter, were like some of the first guys to, they had just opened bow hunting for Greenland. Um, and a guy named Frank Feldman, who is the outfitter that, that run the, the outfit that I went with had done a lot of work. He's a Danish guy to, you know, get bow hunting legal to prove to the government that a bow was, you know, a lethal weapon and it was ethical and whatnot, which seems crazy, you know, talking about that. I think it got legalized in 2015 or something like that. Um, but yeah, so they went over there and they filmed the hunt uh, for bow hunter magazine. And then the, the film was released and it was just incredible, right? You're watching guys, Boa and muskox in a pretty different environment than what you would normally see, like bow hunting them in, or hunting them in general up on the ice in, in Canada uh, or, or, you know, Nunavak Island or something like that. And then they also have the opportunity to hunt um, Canadian barren ground caribou or in that area as well. And, you know, they're, they're, they're hunting these animals and there's big, you know, glacier fjords in the background. It's It was just super unique. And I was like, I really want to do that. And so talked to some friends and I had, I had three buddies that were well, two buddies that were willing to go. And we, we got that out of the books a few years out and that kind of kicked off, you know, just thinking more about what's, what's outside of what we have, you know, in the United States as well. And then the Kazakhstan thing, I'd have a buddy actually lives up here in Alaska and he got kind of the international itch several years ago. And so I just finally said, yeah, I'd like to go try that as well. You know, they're, they're pretty affordable when you would compare them to like doing something like a doll sheep hunt, you know, they're, they're easily half of that type of money, you know? Mm -hmm. So for, for the adventure, I think it's a pretty good bang for your buck. Is there part of you that I don't want to say regret, but I mean, you've, you, you've done those epic hunts out of the country. Like how, is there any way that you could like hunt ptarmigan again? <laughs> yeah, of course. I mean, I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I don't get like, I, like I'm not getting numb to anything. Like I mean, I I'm still just as excited to go shoot a white-tailed deer or a sick of blacktail. I mean, like every hunt to me is just a like it's new, you know. So I, I don't I don't get bored with that kind of stuff at all. I think there's a difference between people who like when you do it for a show. I think that seems like that might be the worst way to continue that enjoyment. Not to say that anybody who has a show doesn't feel like they or doesn't look like they still enjoy it but when it's like a production and there's some people who are already talking about like the the fly that they're using while they're landing the fish it's like oh this is a show like do you even care about yeah. this fish anymore um so i yeah. think when you when you have these epic experiences you're able to kind of piece them out and say this is amazing because it was it was me and my bow on this on this mountain and you know i i, I heard the term again first and so i went that way and i found it and like that can still be so just enrapturing it's totally different than a than a mountain goat or a black-tailed deer or or archery hunting for a for a black bear but um it's it's i i just don't think that we have properly articulated what it is and i don't think we ever will 
to really articulate and put the exact words to that feeling when you are hunting and you're out somewhere. So it doesn't matter what you're hunting. It's just such an incredible experience every time. I agree. And I, and I always say to people too, like one of the things that I think has just like hunting continues to just capture me and consume me more and more every year because of the uniqueness of every hunt. Like you can never like what me and Cody just did that will never be repeated in the same sequence. I mean, we could go caribou hunting a hundred more times and it's not going to be like that. You no, know? cause you'll bring your Crocs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's like, the, that's what, you know, it, I, I just don't see myself ever getting bored with it. You know, there's, there's always a new adventure and a new experience to be had, even if you're hunting the same animal again. Mm-hmm. So what's next on the list? You got uh, big time fall and there's tons of uh, harvest ticket registration stuff. What do you got? Um, I'm, I'm probably going to do a little bit of moose hunting, uh, around here for this first couple weeks of September. Um, I don't have real high hopes. I didn't book a plane. I didn't have time or anything like that to get in on any, you know, remote moose hunt or something like I would have wanted to, but, but, you know, I've got, we got a lot to learn. I've only hunted moose a couple times. So, um, probably just try and get out there and get some boots on the ground and see what I can learn. Um, I drew an elk tag in Montana. Um, so me and Cody are going to hunt together on that, uh, archery tag. So I'll spend the last 10 days or so down there. Um, and then I have a, I'm actually, I went to Kodiak early this year, but I'm also going late on a boat hunt. And so I saved one tag. Uh, my brother's going on that and some friends from Arizona. So do that in late October and that'll pretty much round it out. My dad drew a late, uh, December rifle tag in Arizona that he'd been putting in for, for a long time. So we have that around the Christmas time frame, but, uh, but yeah, that'll kind of wrap up my, my hunting season for the year. So how do you afford these hunts? I and mean, some people think that, oh, if you're doing all these crazy stuff, you must be rich. Other people are just very meticulous about saving and sacrificing. And, and you know, people talk about, ex- uh, what is I think even Cody says, uh, buy experiences, not tags. Or no, buy experiences, not, not gear. gear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> way different. <laughs> So how do you, uh, how do you, how do you afford these things? Do you put money away? Is it like uh, two or three per year that you really save for? Well, I'd say that I worked a lot and I sacrificed a lot in my beginning, like 10 or 12 years of my career. And so that's kind of allowed me to, you know, and then making the right investments and whatnot has allowed me to do more of them now in middle age than, you know, I probably would have been if I, if I wasn't as frugal and, and whatnot then. So, so I benefited from that and yeah, that's how I, I try to do, you know, a couple of bigger hunts to me, you know, every year that, that costs a little bit more besides, you know, just a flight or something like that. But, uh, but yeah, that's, that's kind of how I think about it right now. Yeah. I think there's, there's kind of that, it must be nice crowd, but it would also <laughs> be nice to other people too. Like if you would have been, you know, more frugal from the start and, and kind of had that in mind. And I spent a small fortune when I was in California, just driving almost every weekend to try to just get out. And, um, I, I taught down there for a couple of years and I just needed to get out of the city. And so just yep. driving and, and then rather than camping, I get a hotel over here and there, and then, you know, fly fishing and this and that, you just spend so much money doing that sort of stuff. And so I wasn't stacking money away and, and, coming home every summer to fish, uh, on Prince of Wales, you know, that stuff really adds up. Had I really yep. sacrificed, I'd probably have more money now and whatnot, but you know, being a resident, everything is over the counter or, or registration. So, uh, draw hunts are better, but you can get anything you could ever want registration and over the counter. It's just a matter of, do you have the money to get to where you want to go? Right. Yeah. And I mean, part of that for me, I, so I've worked, I worked and lived in California for a decade and that's, that was a sacrifice too, you know, like that was not the most ideal place to be a resident uh, as most people would know, but you know, I, I dealt with it. I, I made money. I, I enjoyed my time there. You know, I put money away and was able to invest and, you know, that allowed me to, to move to a different area and now I'm here. Where are you at in California? I lived in uh, Concord, Bay area, East Bay area. Okay. I was in uh, Manteca, just South of uh, Sacramento. 
Okay. So, um, I did uh, well, first. I lived there for the first year. I lived in uh, Fresno. I worked for a construction company. We used to, I actually did some small projects in Manteca. Nice. Yeah. Oh, gosh, it's when you look at the history of California. I'm not sure there was a better place to live 200 years ago. Yeah. Like a, it, just paradise. You didn't have to do any of the sacrifices that you have to do in Alaska. It's like the summer is right. going to be amazing. The fall is going to be incredible, but it's going to suck during the winter. There was, yep. it was going to be warm and it was going to be nice. And the Sacramento <laughs> river had three distinct King salmon runs up the Sacramento river. Just un- unreal, just absolute yeah. paradise. And then steelhead coming up the LA river. river. Ugh. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, geographically, like, it's a, it's an amazing state. But, yeah, they've just ruined it. Yeah. Just people. So, yeah. too many people, and then, of course, the politics and whatnot. But, you know, going into to Yosemite, like, there's nowhere in the world that looks like Half Dome and El Capitan. It's just, that's, right. that's so unique. There are some yeah. places that people might say are, are more beautiful, but like that is so unique, but it's so difficult to get in there. And it's just so, it's just too bad, but that's what happens when, when people find nice places. Yeah, exactly. So. Well, uh, what else you got, man, for a, uh, for a closer or any, um, anything that I missed here? Um, I, I think that's about it. What's the best place to eat in uh Soldatna? We went to, St. Elias Brewing and is it uh, Kenai River? Is that the other brewery? Yep. yep. No, those are both really good. I like the food uh, at St. Elias more. Um, there's a pretty good Thai place. I believe it's called just the Pad Thai Cafe, but mm. that's that's one of my favorites. There's not a lot of good restaurants in Soldatna. You can probably notice that. Yeah. I, I like the St. Elias had better pizza, if I remember correctly. And then uh, Kenai River Brewing had, had good burgers. And they had great wings, I, I thought. Right. So yeah. it was nice. They kind of no, complemented like the each other. Um, so is, are you starting to develop a craving for lower 48 food? Like are you getting a weird Jones for, oh, man, I could really use like a Dairy Queen or a Fridays so or uh, Applebee's, In and Out, <laughs> In and Out, and Chipotle. Man, mm. I don't have it. Yeah, yeah, they have a Chipotle <laughs> in Anchorage, but like you're not driving all the way in there for a Chipotle. No. Yeah, In, in and Out and in Chipotle, I think are the two things that when I go to California, I'm I'm think, to visit some friends. I'm like, hey, can we can we go by In and Out? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that'd be kind of cool. Don't ask questions. Buffalo Wild Wings too. Yeah. Um, yeah. they're, they're not great wings, but just something about maybe the environment or something. It's just nice to have, so we don't have a good wing place here in Ketchikan. We don't have much of anything. We got a couple, a couple burger places that are pretty solid and we got some pretty good like fish taco places, but yeah, the down South food tour is definitely a thing. Yeah. Sweet. You guys have more than we have in Soldatna or is it similar? Um, I would say much less. Soldatna surprised me at how big it was commercially. Because it's kind of at the okay. crossroads, you know, people fishing the Kenai stay there, people fishing the Kasilov stay there. Um, yeah. So it almost has like a like too many businesses for the the population, it seems. But uh, yeah, so there's a lot more stuff there than there is here. We just have Walmart, and then everything else is is local, which is which is pretty cool. But you know, I we have a McDonald's and a Subway and Starbucks, but those are everywhere. So, and then you're on the road system, you know, if you do want to go down to homer and and check that stuff out or go into anchorage for a chipotle you can do that but so that's the way it is yep um so where can people find you if you want uh, to to pitch uh pitch your website pitch your your instagram or anything like that go for it yeah no i just probably the most is just my name craig van arsdale on instagram and uh if you want to take a look my website's really just some pictures and links to podcasts I've done and whatnot, but it's on there in the title as well. You can go check it out. Awesome. Thanks, man. I really appreciate uh, you being on here. Congratulations on moving to uh, Alaska and then also for the uh, caribou and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, I don't think, Chef. Do it again. <laughs> cool. Take care, man. All right. Bye-bye. See ya.